ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد الحمد لله we are looking at the third of our lessons surrounding the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We had our introduction, and then we had two classes on them covering their history, the wall, the origins of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, their racial profile, their existence, where they are located, encounters with them and people that have seen the wall we wanted to clear any confusion as best we could surrounding the yajuj and majuj and give a layout as to how close we are to their appearance at the end of time when the barriers breached in this final lesson on yajuj and majuj and other signs we're going to be looking at some five matters today. We're going to be running from yet juj and majuj all the way to the cool wind. This represents the end of all of the minor signs. Every sign that comes after these will be known as the major signs. And the major signs will be when it is too late for someone to believe. The major signs, inshallah, we will cover next week, which will be our epilogue, inshallah, where we sum everything else up. And nothing else will come after that but the day of resurrection. Now, of the five sections we're going to be talking about today is the War of the Great Tribulation, also known as the Malhama, and the event that brings Muslims and Christians in the East together. Number two, we're going to be talking about the end of the war of the Great Tribulation and the subsequent war between Muslims and the body of Christendom. I've given you a number of handouts because when we're talking about Christendom and what Muslims will be encountering as Christendom, we have to use very particular and technical language because the Prophet Wasallam is referring to particular people. Number three, the appearance of Yajuj and Majuj that will cause the final Mahdi, Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, to be sealed in at Dabiq, also known as A'maq, or, or, or excuse me, also referred to as either A'maq or Dabiq, depending on the narration. Number four, the second advent of the Messiah, namely, Nabi Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, that will change the entire direction of the events at the time. Then number five, the victory and the end result, which brings us to the cool wind. Rihan tayyiba, right? Or a cool wind or a wholesome and cool wind. So these are the five things we're looking to complete today, inshallah. And we ask that Allah puts fadl in our efforts and what we're trying to do. And that we are granted victory in this affair. The first of the things we want to cover is the war of the Great Tribulation and the event that shall bring Muslims and Christians in the East together. Dhu Muhammad, also referred to as Dhu Muhammad, who narrated that the Prophet وسلم, said, You will make a sulh treaty with the Byzantines that shall be trustworthy. So, sulh is different to the hudna which we discussed before sulh sulh is where you have a peace treaty that is of an unstated duration of time it's not permanent but it's unstated where a hudna is after is an armistice where you fought each other to a draw a sulh is where there may or may not have been hostilities and there may have been a victor. And the sulh is dealing with the treaty, is dealing with events after that. So there's going to be a sulh 
okay, with the Byzantines that shall be trustworthy. So it won't be treacherous. It won't be wicked. It won't be compromising what we're being told, right? So the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, both you and them shall be victorious over an enemy that shall come from behind. Now understand this then. Something's going to draw Muslims and Byzantines together. Something's going to draw them together. It will be a it will be an enemy that is mutual to both of them. An enemy that is mutual to both of them. He continues. You shall take surrender and peace from that enemy and then divide up the war treasure. Now, the fact that the Muslims are dividing up the war treasure is referring to the fact that the people that they're going to be fighting will not be Muslim. Because the word used is ghanima, which is war treasure. They're not Muslim, this mutual enemy. They are not Muslim. So he goes on to say, you will then come down to a place known as Marj the Talul. Now, Marj the Talul, many people have tried to speculate about Marj the Talul. Marj the Talul literally means uh, a wave bearing a hill. A wave bearing a hill. Talul is the plural, or Talul, some pronounce, is the plural of the word Tel. And Tel means hill or mound. Now, some people have tried to say that that is located in Libya. Some have said it's in Lebanon. Some have said it's in other people have tried to say different places where it might be. There's no one place that has this name. So this may be an area that comes to bear that name in the end of time, or it may just be a descriptive of an area. It may just be a descriptive. He, sallallahu alayhi wasallam goes on to say, At that point, a man from among the Byzantines shall stand up and raise the cross and say, Victory surely came about on account of the cross. Then a Muslim from the other army shall stand up and kill him. Then at that point, the Byzantines shall betray the treaty and there will be great wars of tribulation. They will come to you marching out under 80 banners. And under each banner shall be 10,000 men. This is collected by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal al Musnad, volume 13, pages 171 to 172, hadith number 16,770. Okay, so these people will be saying, victory surely came about on account of the cross, these Byzantines. So that means these will be Christian people that the Muslims will fight as mutual enemies, the Romans. Now, I've given you these maps, okay, for a reason. If we take the first map and take a look at it, we see the extension. This purple area here is the extension of the original Byzantine Empire, known as the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, in Arabic, every time the word room has been used, because that's the word used in the Arabic of the Hadith, Rome has always technically referred to the Byzantine Empire. There's never been a time. The Byzantine Empire or the areas that fall within it. There's never been a time where the Prophet ﷺ used the word Rome and he specifically meant um, pale skinned people with translucent skin and blue veins or blonde haired blue eyed people. Because if he meant them, there's specific words that we have for them. Like the Bani Asfar, the people of the yellow hair. There's specific words that we have for specifically white people. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about a religious demographic of people. And the people that are next to the Muslims that are near them aren't Protestants. They're not them. They're not Protestants. They're not evangelicals. The entire Middle East, the entire Arab area, even if you go to India, the Christians in India aren't evangelicals. They belong to a group called the Maronite Orthodox Church. Not even the Christians in India. There's a community in India that's 1,700 years old. They're not even Protestants. 
The Protestants that are in India have either come from Pakistan or they are converts from people that have come, evangelicals that have come from the United States. So all these people around this area from Morocco all the way over are what are called Orthodox Christians, whether it's Greek Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Antiochian. All these different groups are them. Okay? Now on the other map, I've shown the distribution of the Orthodox Christian religion per country based on a color scheme. And you can see all these different groups surrounding the Muslims. So we're not talking about Protestants. We're talking about people who are belonging to the Eastern Orthodox non-Latin rite. It's these people. All right, all the countries they're in. Let's take another look at another map. When we're talking about the country, the people that the Muslims encounter, they're encountering the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is composed of seven rites. I've given you a chart here. There are seven rites. The first rite is known as the Roman rite or the Latin rite. That's what people mistakenly refer to as Roman Catholic. You don't need to say Rome and Catholic. They're both, they mean the same thing. It's like saying, uh, it's, it's, it's like saying jumbo shrimp. They're both, they're, they're the same. You don't need to refer to them twice, right? So when someone's Catholic and they're Latin rite, they're either Roman rite or they're Latin rite. This is one of the rites. The next rite is Byzantine rite. Byzantine rite. These other two that are next to the Roman rite, which reads Ambrosian and Mozarabic, they are subsets of the Roman rite, and they're not independent rites themselves. These are traditions of uh, monasticism. But the you have the Byzantine rite, then you have the Armenian rite. Right? After that, you have the different Syrian rites. You have the Maronite rite, which is Western Syrian. You have the Chaldean rite. Then you have the Coptic rite. All these different groups, when you put them together, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven rites to the Catholic Church, and these are them. That is what the Muslims in these countries are generally in contact with. Protestants also don't say, we've been given victory by the cross. Protestants don't say that. Because they don't use the crucifix and march into war under the crucifix. That's not what they do. Protestants don't have that as their custom. So we're not talking about a Protestant people. Forget about all the Protestants. Anglicans, Baptists. Forget about all the offshoots that have come. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. They're, they're spring shots from them. We're not talking about them. And most of the countries where they come from anyway today are atheistic. When's the last time you've heard an American say, we, we, we marched out in the name of the cross? The cross gave us victory. When's the last time someone English said the cross gave us victory? Germany. Belgium. Look at even this map. Look at the distribution of, of the Orthodox churches in the Western Europe. It's almost gone. Right? The Germans, they're all Protestants. They're Lutherans for the most part. You have Protestants that are in Scandinavia. Germanic Protestants further up. You have Germanic Protestants in, in England. You have some Catholics in Ireland, but they're losing ground. Then you have all the Romance Catholics of France and everything, but they're mostly dead. France is a secular republic. It's went through three, three difficult republics. The only people that you have left of the Orthodox Church are the, Slav are the Slavic Orthodox, which are Russian Orthodox from Russia, the Baltic Catholics, and then you have all the people in the Baltic states. So you have your Croats, your Serbs, all these people belong to these churches. So when we're talking about the Byzantines and the Romans, we're not talking about uh, a people that are coming from Skokie, Illinois. We're not talking about 
John Smithers who lives in Dorset. We're not talking about him. We're talking about a specific gathering of Christians that are around the Muslims and that the Muslims have had treaties with. And the Muslims have had treaties with these people before. Muslims haven't had treaties with Protestants because there's no Protestant armies to speak of historically. Muslims have never signed treaties with Protestants, but Muslims have signed treaties with the Roman or the Latin rite of the Catholic Church. They've signed treaties with the Antiochian Church because they have they have both a military side and a, a religious temporal side. Protestant countries are known for separating between the powers, so a minister can't sign off on a treaty. Their soldiers do. This is an important distinction to make because some people, when they're reading these ahadith, they're thinking that it's going to be someone like, well, I remember when uh, in the 80s into the 90s, people were like, oh, it's gonna be Bush or one of the Bushes or someone like that. They're not Christians. They're not Christians according to, they're not Christians according to the Orthodox Church. Remember, the Protestant churches are seen as heretical breakoffs. If you get an opportunity and you really want to see how the Orthodox churches see the Protestant churches, it's very, very long. And it will take you probably a couple of days to read through it. Look up the Council of Trent, T-R-E-N-T. When the Pro when the Protestant Reformation first happened. The Catholic Church of the Latin Rite sat down and reviewed all the positions of Martin Luther and other people during that time. And their response, the Counter-Reformation, was the Council of Trent. And in there, you see their true feelings about what they understand Protestants to be. The same thing that happened when one of the most famous Protestants recently, and it caused a huge stir, Hank Hanegraaff, who ran the Christian Research Institute, converted to Greek Orthodox. When that happened, the Greek Orthodox made him recite the Athanasian Creed, made him affirm the seven sacraments of the church. Literally, they gave him what we would call, they gave him Shahada again. They started him fresh. All the knowledge that he had, everything that he knew before was worthless. This man's been teaching Christianity for 30, 40 years. He's, he's referred to as a neophyte, a convert, a catechumen. He's on ground floor level. That's what the Orthodox Church thinks of Protestants. So, we have to be very clear. Now, our next hadith is Abu Darda radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the encampment of the Muslims on the day of the battle of the Great Tribulation shall be at a place called al ghota on the outskirts to the side of the city of Damascus. At that point, al ghota will be one of the best of the cities of Sham. This is collected by Imam Abu Dawood as Sijistani in his Sunan. So we understand there'll be an encampment before this huge battle takes place. And it'll be al ghota not far from Damascus, right? That's that's capable of being found today if you look up, look it up on your map. So it's somewhere that exists today, but it's not heavily populated, and it's not it doesn't have any significance right now, but it will. Now there are two other events, or one there's one other event that's close to the time, but it's not directly related, but it will be happening around the same time. And these ahadith are always put with these ahadith about the Muslims and the Byzantines. And they are the following. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The hour shall not come until the Euphrates dries up, revealing a mountain of gold and treasure underneath, and people shall kill one another for it. Out of every 100 people, 99 shall be killed in the fight. Every man among them shall have that one that will be saved. This is collected by my Muslim in Al Jami' al Sunan al Sahih under his book of tribulations, Kitab al Fitin. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu also narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A time will come in which the Euphrates River will dry up and reveal a treasure of gold that is beneath it. Whoever is present there should take nothing from it. 
This is collected by my Muslim in al Jamia Sahih under the Book of Tribulations as well, Kitab al Fitr. So we understand then that there'll be some war because of what gets uncovered. Now, the Euphrates has not dried up, but it is going through dry spells in which its water level drops, then it comes up. Its water level drops, and it comes up. Part of this goes back to if you study uh, Saddam Hussein's war against the Marsh Arabs. He tried to completely kill every single one of the Bedouin Marsh Arabs. Um, often the Bedouin Arabs are referred to as Bidun, which is one of the Arabic words of stateless peoples, because they don't have allegiance to a flag or a state per se. And because of that, they're a, they're a, a risk to the government. People that set up things that are called states and nation states. The Bedouins are a risk to this because their first allegiance is to their clan and to their families and not to a flag. So it's a problem to deal with them because these are stateless peoples. <clears throat> um, the Euphrates has not completely dried up. We've not yet heard anything about any gold being uncovered, but this prophecy is still pending. Now, the second point that we come to is the end of the war of the Great Tribulation and the subsequent war between Muslims and the body of Christendom. So we've already laid some of the groundwork of what we're talking about when we talk Christendom. We've already explained, the Prophet Sallallahu has told us, that there'll be some event that shall happen that will draw Muslims together in a mutual battle as war allies against a common enemy. When that ceases, we've already found that a Christian will say, it's because of the cross that we were given victory. A Muslim will rise up and kill that man. And then the war shall happen between Muslims and Christendom. So let us speak. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the hour shall not be established until the inheritance will not be divided up. People will not rejoice in the war treasure. He was reclining and then said while facing Sham, an enemy shall come from there that shall be gathered against the people of Islam and the people of Islam shall gather for them. I said, is it the Byzantines? He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, yes, indeed it is them. There shall be a great fight between you. This is known Okay, as the subsequent, this is the subsequent war between the Muslims and the body of Christendom. So the end of the great war of tribulation and then the war between the Muslims and the Christians. It's also called a malhama, a tribulation. Malhama is also the word used for slaughter. <clears throat> the Muslims shall have a group set aside that shall fight to the death or will not return except victorious. So they shall fight and kill until night shall come upon them. Then each side shall fight and neither side shall be victorious. A group shall come forward to fight and the Muslims will send forth a group that shall fight and not return or not return unless victorious. They shall fight and kill until the night shall come to them, and there shall be no victory between them. Then a group of Muslims shall go forward to fight and be killed, and will not go forward except to be victorious. They will go forward, fight, and kill until evening comes. Then each one shall march forward. This will continue until they will face one another, and there shall be no victory between them. Then a troop of Muslims shall go forward on the fourth day, and a group of the Muslims shall suffer a setback in the battle. They will kill and be killed in a large scale war. This shall be a war in which those who died shall be such a large number that nothing like it will have been seen before. Now I want you to understand this. <clears throat> From what we know, when you divide up Christianity, Christianity, we're looking at possibly 1.7 billion people. We'll subtract off the Protestants. We'll give them a high number. We'll say that they're 300 million. 
we'll subtract them off. That leaves you with 1 billion 400 million. The majority of those Christians are Latin Rite, then Russian Orthodox, then your Greek Orthodox, then Byzantine. And these are all countries that have armies. Now look at these countries. Russia, strong Russian Orthodox. Strong army? Yes, strong army. Strong army. Right. Okay. You look at Rome, Latin Rite, Italy. Strong army? Strong army. Latin Rite. You look at the Byzantines, which still have a place in Turkey and also other areas. Still have strength. You still have Christians in the Syrian army. You have Christians. Lebanon is 50% and some say 53% Maronite Christian. You remember the war that happened between Muslims and Christians there? And the Muslims got the bat into the stick. If you want to study that, you study, study what's called the Falange Massacres. The Falange Massacres. They almost wiped out all the Palestinians in Lebanon. That's a strong army. So all these countries that have these huge Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, have these, have strong or at least comparable armies. We're not saying every single one of them will be marching. But even if it's in the millions, that's still a lot of people. You look at the area that's going to be affected, which will be the Middle East stroke North Africa. You're looking at about 300 million people. Even if a million of them are fighting, there's still going to be people that are going to be hit by whatever they're hit with. There are still going to be people that are going to starve to death on the battlefield, die of injuries. They'll be hit by friendly fire. Millions upon millions of upon millions. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the like of which has not been seen before. That's why it's called Al-Malhamatul Kubra, the greatest tribulation. Now let's talk about this. The Prophet ﷺ said, they will kill and be killed in a large-scale war. This shall be a war in which those who died shall be such a large number that nothing like it will have been seen before. This will be so much the case that a bird will try to fly over the battlefield of the dead on both sides, and before it can cross to the other side, it will fall down dead from exhaustion. That's a huge battlefield. So a bird will attempt to span the entirety of that battlefield to fly across. And in the process of trying to do so, will fall down dead from exhaustion. This gives you an idea of the understanding of the numbers we're talking about. These are huge numbers, which means the armies that are going to be mobilized to do this must be huge. The biggest that we possibly will have ever seen. This will be so much, this will be so much the case that a bird will try to fly over the battlefield of the dead on both sides. And before it can cross to the other side, it will fall down dead from exhaustion. When the dead are surveyed, they will not find anyone among them alive except for one man. What war treasure will he have to rejoice in? Or what inheritance does he have to divide between them? The Prophet ﷺ is giving this rhetorical flourish because he's saying, this one man who's left out of all of this, what war treasure will he have to rejoice in? Because there's nothing to divide up because his emir is dead. The helper to the emir is dead. The men in his platoon are dead. The men in his troop are dead. All those other men, they're dead. What inheritance can he pass out? Meaning to his family, they're wiped out. So this battle is going to be so huge that there'll be entire families exterminated so there'll be no one to divide up the inheritance and give to because the entire families have been extinguished. That's when you don't give inheritance because entire families in this war will have been extinguished. So there's no one to give the inheritance to. That's why he's giving this rhetorical response. It's, it's driving a point home to you to make you understand how's he going to do anything? 
And this man himself, he doesn't have any inheritance to give because his family's been wiped out. That's why he's saying he's not rejoicing in any inheritance because his family's been wiped out. All the men on the other side, they've been wiped out. Now let's let him continue. Likewise, when they hear of a harm greater than that, a shout shall come behind them saying, indeed, the false Messiah is hot on their heels, heels behind them. They shall drop what is in their hands and go forward and 10 horsemen shall go forward. Okay, so of those, that man that's left when they're surveying the dead and they find that one man that's alive, there'll be other troops around that area that weren't on the theater of war for whatever reason, whatever happens. There'll be 10 horsemen left. So there'll be 10 men left with this one guy. There'll be 11 and maybe some other reserves because you usually have reserves. Now let's sleep, listen to what he says. They shall drop what is in their hands and go forward, and ten horsemen shall go forward. I know their names, the names of their fathers, and the very colors of their horses. They shall be the best of the horsemen on the face of the earth at that time, or among the best on the face of the earth at that time. Now, this is collected by my Muslim in the Sahih under Kitab al-Fitin, the Book of Tribulations. So here the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, he knows their names, the names of their fathers, the colors of their horses. He's saying, so this is a real event. It's not a metaphor. These are people, they're real people. It's not a metaphor, it's not a simile. These are real events that are going to take place. Events that will shake the very foundations of what we understand currently. We think wars now we think the wars that we've heard of or read about or seen, we think they're big because our standpoint, understanding and measurement is based on either maybe what someone said or stats that we've read. The biggest stat some of us may have read is 55 million as the death count of those who died in the European Civil War, the second one, what they're calling World War II, but it involved Europeans killing a lot of other people besides themselves. That war is supposed to have had the death count of 55 million. And the first one was supposed to have a death count of 37 million because of trench warfare. Now, this is going to be something when the Prophet ﷺ said, the like of which has never been seen before. That means it's going to be more than 55 million. It would have to be if it's the like which hasn't been seen before. It has to be more than 55 million. It has to be more than the 42 million Chinese killed by Genghis Khan. And his army, when they swept down in the 13th, it has to be more than that. It has to be more than the Cambodian massacres in the killing fields. It has to be more than the Vietnamese massacres. It has to be more than that. It has to be more devastating than the Middle Passage where 100 million people were stolen from West Africa and transported to South and Central and North America. It has to be greater than that. It has to be if it hasn't been seen. The like of it hasn't been seen before. It has to be greater than the Slavic slavery that happened in which all these Slavic peoples were stolen from Russia and nearby areas and shifted to Germany and other places. I mean, even the word slave in English comes from the word Slav. That's our word for slave in English, unfortunately. Because Slavs were so badly taken as slaves and they became so regularly known to be slaves that the word Slav became synonymous with slave. That's why we have the word slave in English. Because it means Slav when you trace the etymology all the way back. The etymon is Slav. It's going to be greater than that. It'll be something the like of which we haven't seen before. Right. Now, circumstances become more dire, which is what leads us to the third point. The appearance of Yajuj and Majuj that will cause the final Mahdi, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, alayhi salam, to be sealed in a dabiq. Now understand this. The three Mahdi's that we've studied about, the ones that we've read up on, if you look at the times that they've appeared, they've been drastic times. The Mahdi of the Sudan, Muhammad Ahmed Abdullah, alayhi salam, when he appeared, the British Empire, had just brought about the minigun and they were strong in the earth. They were the people to beat. They couldn't lift the Mahdi of Sudan from the earth. He beat them vigorously. And he fought the same amount of battles against them that the Prophet ﷺ fought in Islam, which was 27. 
Well, this is going to be no different. The, this Mahdi will be no different, in which he will come at a time where there's hardships, as we know from the Hadith, that he will fill the earth with justice and righteousness at the time that it shall be filled with tyranny and oppression. That's how the Hadith, the Hadith run if you have your notes. So let's look at this then. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The hour shall not come until the Byzantines come down to Al Amaq or Dabiq. Now remember, that's the place where that great battle takes place between the Muslims and Byzantines. They're coming down to this area. An army shall march out to them from the people of Al Medina, and they shall be at that time by the best of the people of the earth. When they're facing each other on the theater of war, the Byzantines shall say, Open the way between us and those who took our women as prisoners so that we might fight them. The Muslims shall say, No, by Allah, we shall not open the way between you and our brothers. The Muslims shall fight them and a third of them shall recoil and Allah shall not accept that of them. Then a third of them shall be killed and they will be the most noble and virtuous of martyrs in the sight of Allah. The next third will conquer and win and they shall not have been tested in that way before. Then they will conquer Constantinople and divide up the war treasure that shall be amassed in abundance. They will hang their swords at the olive trees when suddenly they shall hear a shout. The Messiah is behind you. They will head out and that call will prove to be false. When they make their way to Sham, the false Messiah shall come out to them in built up numbers for battle. Now look, the Muslims have just had to deal with the great tribulation and the Byzantines. And the false Messiah comes out one wave after the other. One wave after the other. The Muslims have just dealt with this issue and the false messiah is either in the earth and comes from that area or he appears suddenly. So there's going to be a succession of events that the Muslims will be faced with in rapid succession. Let's, let's continue. They will head out and that call will prove to be false. When they make their way to Sham, the false messiah shall come out to them in built up numbers for battle. Their ranks shall be separated and they shall face one another while the Muslims are blockaded. This shall be the case. Then when the prayer is about to be established, Isa ibn Maryam will descend and lead them. When the false messiah sees the true messiah, the enemy of Allah shall melt, just as salt melts in water. He shall continue to melt until nothing remains of him and he is completely destroyed. Allah shall indeed kill the false messiah at the hand of the true messiah and his blood shall issue forth from his dissolved torso. This is collected by my Muslim in Al-Jami' al-Sahih. Okay, under Kitab al -Fitin. So we see then that the appearance of Yajuj and Majuj, this is coming. I haven't mis misnumbered this. It's coming or, or misnamed it. But firstly, we're setting up the, f the final Mahdi, Al-Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, being sealed in a dabiq with the Muslim armies. And Nabi Isa alayhi salam, these appearances will be in succession around the same time. Now, some people have said it's one, two, three, one, two, three, or this way or that. All I can give is the details that I've got. And I'll leave it to other people to decide which position they're going to take. So we come to number four, the second advent of the Messiah, namely Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, that will change the entire direction of events. So the Muslims have faced this huge tribulation, got in a fight with the Byzantines. Okay? Now remember, the Muslims fought together with the Byzantines against a common enemy. Then they will have to fight the Byzantines. Then they have to also contend with the false messiah. All these things are happening and Imam al-Mahdi is in the earth. They're having to contend with all these things. And when things look like they couldn't get any worse, when things get to their lowest ebb, this is when things come about. Where Allah the Exalted brings about the victory. Because most of what we've read, and I'm being as frank as possible, a lot of what we've read have just been tribulation after tribulation, wave after wave, wave after wave. And we're waiting patiently for that victory. We're waiting. When's that victory going to come? When is that victory going to come? When is that, when is that victory going to come? We're waiting for that victory. This now is the setup for that victory. And it runs the following. And Nawas ibn Sam'an narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The false Messiah will be nothing to fear if he appears and I am among you, and I will be your defender. If he should appear while I am not among you, then each man is his own protector and Allah is the protector over every Muslim. 
This man to come will be a man of height with tight curls and one eye that is damaged, floating like a grape. His resemblance is like that of Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan. Whoever among you shall live to see him, then let him recite the opening passages of Surah Al-Kahf against him. He shall appear at a place between Sham and Iraq with destruction following him on his right and left. Slaves of Allah, remain steadfast. We said, Messenger of Allah, how long shall he remain in the earth? The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, replied, 40 days. One day shall be like a year, one like a month, and one like a week. The rest of his days shall be like your days. We said, Messenger of Allah, on that day that is like a year, is it sufficient for us to just make one prayer? He said, no. Calculate the time so that you might know the prayers. We said, Messenger of Allah, how, sh how fast shall he move in the earth? He said, like a cloud being pushed along by the wind. He shall come to the people and call them, and they shall believe in him and answer his call. Now, this is similar to what we discussed under the topic of the false messiah and Nabi Isa alayhi salam. But watch how the Prophet sallallahu draws all of these events together now. Everything of what we've so far studied is now going to start to even out. The blurriness that may have existed in some people's minds regarding some of the events, the Prophet sallallahu will bring it together chronologically and also in the ways of gathering together all the data and making it cohesive. So he continues. He will command the sky and it will rain, command the earth and it will give up its vegetation. The Messiah shall come down to the white eastern minaret in Damascus at Fajr time in two pieces of clothing that are white with a robe and an overgarment for it. He will have his hands placed on the wings of two angels and his hair shall be wet as it had been beforehand. Now remember, Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes, is coming back according to what we've read then. He's not going to be wearing Obey and Obey t-shirt with uh, Levi's 501s or corduroy pants with uh, corduroy house shoes. No. He's coming back the same way that he left. And the wetness of the hair, we remember from when he ascended that his hair was wet from the wudu that he had made. So his hair is still wet, so that means it's the same wudu from 2,000 years ago, plus. So he's coming back the exact same way. So how he left is how he's coming back. So he's not going to look like John Travolta. He's not going to look like any of these other people. He's not going to look like that. He's coming back how he left. Okay. So he says, continuing, Whenever he turns in a direction, the mist of that shall come off his hair. It shall resemble pearls coming off his head. Any unbeliever who encounters him shall be destroyed by the noble scent and power that emanates from him. The Messiah will seek out the false Messiah until he catches him at Bab Lud and then kills him there. Then Isa ibn Maryam shall come to a people that Allah has protected from the false Messiah. And he shall anoint their faces and speak to them of their ranks to come in the paradise. Why? Because they persevered in the great tribulation. So these people, he'll anoint their faces. He'll give them glad tidings of the paradise. Why? Because they forbeared. They were forbearing during this great tribulation. They saw the time of, of Al-Masih al-Dajjal and they survived. They struggled. They, they were protected. They somehow went to places where they knew, okay, I'll be safe here or what have you. And they persevered. They didn't obey him. They didn't answer his call. They didn't worship him. They did not follow him. And they kept themselves and their loved ones protected. And so they're told because of that, he tells them their places in the paradise that they can expect. That they can expect. Not, well, it may be or could be, right? It's not, no. It's, well, inshallah. No, no, no. This is where you're going to be. Now let him continue. The Prophet ﷺ says, at that time as well, Allah will reveal to Isa, indeed I have sent out slaves that belong to me, that no one has the power to fight against them. Take these noble slaves of mine to Mount Sinai. So, Mount Sinai is in, is in today's Egypt, which is actually part of Arabia, that peninsula. So he's saying, take these slaves of mine that have survived in that area, take them to Mount Sinai. And he's sending against you a people 
can't be fought off. Now look, Allah will then send forth yet Juj and Medjuj. Who? Allah will send them forward. Why? Because he's the creator, the master, the king, the holy one, the righteous one. He's the one that's in charge of history. He's the one that's doing this. This is part of Allah's salvation plan and how he set up. The plan that Allah has laid out from the foundation stone being laid of this creation up until today has been part of a well-oiled plan, whether he's called it in the Quran, Mekar, plan, Qadr, measurement, qada, whatever he's called it, it refers to a clearly measured out plan, system, way, and everything. Everything's been put there. So now we have Nabi Isa contemporaneous with the Mahdi, contemporaneous with the false Messiah, contemporaneous with Yajuj and Majuj, and now we can see the order that things are happening in, can't we? We can see, okay, this is, this is the direction we can expect things to come in now. So now our minds are totally focused, and what we've also read before, we can carefully stack it and file it to where now we have a greater resonance and clarity. So let's continue now. <clears throat> At that time as well, Allah will reveal to Isa, indeed I have sent out slaves that belong to me, that no one has the power to fight against them. Take these noble slaves of mine to Mount Sinai. Allah will then send forth yet Juj and Medjuj, and they shall sweep down from every high place. The first of them shall pass by Lake Tiberias and drink from it, and what is in it. When the last of Yajuj and Medjuj pass Lake Tiberias, they will say, at one time there used to be water here. Okay, so Lake Tiberias, as we said, is in what's being called today the state of Israel. Now, we know the Yajuj and Medjuj at the time of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. So the people saying Yajuj and Medjuj are the Jews in, Jews in Israel right now, that, that's, that can't be right. And we know the people that are saying Yajuj and Medjuj are the English, that can't be right. Because their numbers are so huge, they're drinking it in one instant. And that the claim that's being made that, well, the Israelis are emptying Tiberias, that's not correct. Because Lake Tiberias has water tables under it that go through seasonal changes and fluctuations. And those fluctuations sometimes bring it low in the summertime and high in the winter. So those people are not telling the truth. They're either willfully lying or they're honestly mistaken. But in whatever case it is, the English aren't yet Juj and Medjuj. The Jews that are in Israel aren't yet Juj and Medjuj. These are different people because they're going by and gulping it down. Now let's continue. The Prophet Wasallam said, Allah shall protect and shore up the Prophet of Allah, Isa, and his companions. Until the world is made anew and the head of a bull for them shall be better than a hundred dinars in the estimation of one of you now. The Prophet of Allah Isa and his companions shall earnestly call on Allah and he will send against Yajuj and Majuj a disease that shall be like wormwood and strike them in their necks. In the morning they shall come and find all Yajuj and Majuj dead in a huge pile. The Prophet of Allah Isa and his companions shall come down to the land and will not find one hand span of area except that it's covered with the corpses of Yajuj and Majuj. So the Prophet of Allah Isa and his companions will earnestly call on Allah and he shall send a flock of birds with necks like the Bukht camel. They shall carry away and eat all of what they're able to do as much as Allah has willed. So the birds with necks like the Bukht camel. The Bukht camel, if you look at that's known as the Bactrian camel, the Central Asian camel. That's a long neck with very, very short amount of hair on it. So these are vulture-like creatures, like buzzards, which would make sense because they're scavengers. So whoever these birds are, they will be vulture or scavenger, perhaps buzzard-like birds that will come and pick at this meat and carry away whatever Allah wills for them to consume. So this is the victory. So the false Messiah has been defeated. The end of the Great Tribulation. Byzantine armies have been stopped. The Khawarij have been defeated because they're in the army of the, of, of, the, of the Dajjal as we know from the other Ahadith. The external enemy has been beaten. Now we're entering into the period of victory. Everything's been completed. Let's look. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, then Allah shall send down rain that shall cleanse the earth until it's left like a shining silver platter. Then it will be said to the earth, bring, for, bring forth your fruits and the blessings within you. At that point, all shall come to pass to the point that one group will be able to feast on one large pomegranate. 
and seek shade in its skin. Such case shall there be, until that one morsel from the meat of a camel will suffice a body of men. One morsel of the cow shall suffice the tribe from people, and one morsel from a sheep shall suffice several tribes of men. That shall carry on in similar manner, until Allah shall send a wholesome wind, that shall flow and move under the armpits of the people. This very wind shall take the soul of every believer and every Muslim. And the worst of people shall remain behind moving around and doing intercourse with one another like donkeys in the street. And it is upon these people that the hour shall come. This is collected by my Muslim in Al-Jami'u Sahih under Kitab al fitin under the chapter of making mention of the false messiah. Dhikr al Masih al-Dajjal. Now understand this then. So all of the tribulation that this ummah has gone through, all the trials, all the difficulties, it ends at that point. So Nabi Isa alayhi salam, now look, look at what's being said. It will be said to the earth, bring forward your fruits and blessings within you. So whatever's inside of you, all the good that's in you, whatever metals, whatever fruit, whatever veg, whatever water, all the good that's in you, the blessings in you, bring that forth. Allah shall command it to do that. Right now, what's the earth doing? Withholding it. Do you know that it takes three to five apples to get this three to five apples grown today to get the nourishment that you would get from one apple from the 1940s because the nitrogen levels in the soil are so low? But this is exactly what the situation is. The earth is withholding its blessings. Who's making it do that? Who's responsible for it? The scientists can tell you how, but I don't care how a combustion engine's working. I want to know why when I stick my key and it's not starting or why it explodes. I know how, but the why, this is the issue. Now, when it mentions that, when the Prophet ﷺ mentions, he mentions enormous fruits. So one group of people will be able to feast on one large pomegranate and seek shade in its skin. If the earth is bringing forth its fruit and veg and its livestock, back to the state in which it was in previously. That means that the earth is going back to its original state in some way, shape, or form. What does that mean? That then should make us now start to have wheels turning in your mind. How often have I mentioned about them excavating 50 foot around tree stumps? Alligators as long as buildings. Brontosauruses that are taller than the building that we're in. This is obviously telling you that the earth that we lived on before, the sheer size of animals, the sheer size of fruit and veg, the size they found one dragonfly that was from years and years ago. And that dragonfly, that dragonfly was as long as a kitten and close to the same 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 size, and it had a three-foot wingspan. Obviously, the world was different to what it is now. The world is withholding, the Arab, al Arab is withholding some of it. Why? Because someone's telling it to. Who? Allah is withholding that. But that comes to an end. That stops at this point. When you have an entire qabila, an entire tribe from a morsel, the word luqma, and some, some narrations it has luqha, in Arabic means what fits in your hand. A morsel of food from that animal will be enough to feed an entire tribe. That means that there's some massive changes going on. Massive changes that are going to happen. And this is the victory that's been mentioned. There's not going to be a labor party. There's not going to be a conservative party. The Republicans and the Democrats will have to hang their shingle up. It's the end of this entire wicked system. Everything that belongs to this regime and wicked system of things comes to an end at that point. And this Ummah returns back to what? Being ruled by prophets. Which is what the Maraja people who are referred to as Ulul Amr or Ahl Istimbat or whatever else, they've been telling us that before when they were ruling in their place 
as their deputies and representatives, hadn't they been? Hadn't the Abdal been telling us that the leaders of this ummah in the absence of the prophets are them, but when the prophets return, that they go to their position? Isn't it them, these Abdal who give the bay'ah to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam because they'll recognize who he is? Isn't it them? This ummah is either ruled by prophets or <clears throat> it is ruled by those who are their representatives. Now we return back to that. So you have the Mahdi taking over, then the Nabiuna Isa alayhi salam comes back and he takes over over general rule. And we're back in an absolute monarchy again with a king, which is what it had been before, which is how it's supposed to be in the home. So we will see the end of left and right and um, social justice and feminism and all these other things, this stuff dies. It's over with. That's finished. Anything that is not from Allah that doesn't belong to him is finished. Anything that's not of him. Because his holy will is carried out. And what he is pleased with comes to fruition. What he's pleased with. Now let's talk about this cool wind. We come to the victory and the end result, which brings us to the cool wind. So when the cool wind comes, there won't be any Muslim left on earth. No one will be left except those that reject faith. Now we're told in one hadith that is in the Sahih of a Muslim, that, and I just want to give a short introduction to this, that when people are being brought out, that Allah the Exalted says, out of every 900, out of every thousand people that are in the fire, those, those who are not condemned to remain forever, pull out one. Now just process that for a second. So out of 1,000 people that are in the fire, only one doesn't stand condemned for all eternity. That, in addition to that, when you consider the fact that Allah the Exalted, when he causes the Muslims to die from the cool wind that comes, it leaves nothing but unbelievers. And when the sun rises from the west, which we'll be covering next week, they will desire to believe, but it will be too late for any soul to believe that has not before, that hasn't sent forth any good and hasn't benefited from its faith. What was the point of that? Why would, why would they try to believe and why would there be a call and condemnation when Allah the Exalted has already made it clear that once the cool wind has come, that they won't be able to respond to faith. So then why would they hear the horn of, fr of fright and terror and want to believe and can't? What, what, what would be the point of this? The same point that we harped on about in the tefsir classes where Allah said that had Allah known any good in them, he would have made them to hear. And had he, had he wanted them to be guided, he would have made them hear to respond to the call. That means that there are people that exist in this world that are eternally condemned by Allah the Exalted. And what he's showing you in these ahadith, in these verses, is that <clears throat> his holy righteous will is completed and fulfilled. But he also shows you the state of the human race if left unattended. So here you have the natural man, what they like to call the natural man left unattended okay so we'll take away islam we'll take away these other things we'll take away the call because they say what we're told nowadays is that well people are basically at heart they're going to be good people and they'll find their way and people in the in the end they just want what's right and what's good okay so now we're going to take things away islam will be removed from the earth the Kaaba will be demolished all these other things find your way but they don't because they can't, because they won't, because they reject faith. 
because they're eternally condemned. And the plan, what Allah has done throughout all of history, if you look at all the prophets all the way up until now, why is it that there's always a small body that believes and follows and the rest stand, stand condemned? Nabi Nuh, alayhi salam, his three sons and their wives, and his wife, that's it. Nabi Musa, alayhi salam, the children of Israel are taken out of Egypt, that's it. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Those that believe in him and the rest of humanity stand condemned. Now we come to the end of time. The human race stands condemned, and that's it. Doesn't say anything about Hindus being swept away, Buddhists, your local garden variety pagan. Doesn't say anything about those people, because those people stand condemned. And it's these ahadith that burn the nostrils, figuratively and literally, of those people that want to play games with this religion, that want to water it down that want to soften Islam, that want to take off the rough edges because they want to tapioca pudding this religion. But every time they taste it, they, every time they taste it, they choke on it. Because there's the bottom line that there are Muslims and that there are kufar. I don't like that word. I use non-Muslim. Well, then don't be a kafir if you don't like that word. But this is the way that it's been given that people stand condemned. The Catholics can't help you. The Protestants can't help you. The Hindus can't help you, whether and the Buddhists can't help you, the, the Theravadan Buddhists can't help you, the Hinayana Buddhists can't help you, the Balinese Buddhists can't help you, the Tibetan Buddhists can't help you, uh, the Buddhists like what uh, Patrick Duffy and Tina Turner follow, they can't help you. None of these people can help you. The only salvation that Allah will accept is the one in which he has made as part of his plan. That's the only one. Any other thing is someone trying to give their righteousness to Allah through their deeds, through sacrificing of animals, or through someone else's righteousness. Well, so-and-so is basically a good person. Well, wait a minute, hold on. Allah the Exalted defined it in major shirk as worshiping other than Allah by or uh, having partners, making partners with Allah, believing in partners besides Allah. And putting barriers between Allah and the creation or Allah and the worshiper that aren't there. So what would be a barrier between Allah and his creation but deeds if someone said, well, I'm a good person. So wait a minute, hold on. Deeds, were they created by Allah or you? Well, they're created by Allah. So they're his. Yes. So you are seeking salvation from Allah through the deeds that he created. You're going to present them to him. In order to please him, and it's something he created and it's his property, and you're going to give it to him, and that will be the basis for your forgiveness of sins, salvation from the destruction of the fire for all eternity, and entrance into the paradise? It's his property. Or will you offer him rams and sacrifice, which are his, to please him with blood that you've shed, for him to forgive your sins and give you interest into the paradise because you've given him the animals that you beheaded and drained their blood, that that's, that's sufficient for his pleasure? Or that this other person who his deeds are created, I'm leaning on him and he's a creation with created deeds and I'm going in front of you, Allah, to please you with that so that I get sorted. Because that's what Allah wants, is it? So this hadith and all the other ahadith are putting in perspective that no, Allah is the only one that can give salvation. And the only way is through la ilaha illallah, which is his rahmah, which is brought about by la ilaha illallah. And no one, no one can believe that or respond unless he's made it possible for them to. Because someone that's spiritually dead can't put the paddles together and, and, and make himself come back to life. It's only Allah that can do this. That's why in the Quran, when Allah talks about giving salvation and people going into the paradise, he always mentions it in the passive tense, meaning that you're not doing it. Someone external is doing it, which is him. But now, because we've been to college or we've been to university or we style ourselves intelligent, right? We can now use the bathroom unaided, right? Because we've been fully potty trained and now we begin, we can eat food without our hands shaking because we have fine motor function. 
We can take four steps without walking up, without falling over and having to be stilted back up by our parents. We believe ourselves independent. But no. And that is what this final piece brings us today. So let's look at this fifth and final point. But I just wanted to put that there because Allah's plan is clear throughout history. Okay, so we have the victory and the end result, which brings us to the cool wind. The first hadith. It was narrated by Aisha, radiallahu anha, who mentioned the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prophesied, and night and the day will keep passing until Allah and al uzza are worshipped. I said, Messenger of Allah, what about what Allah said? He is the one who sent his messenger with the guidance and the true religion so that it might be dominant over all other religions. This is even though the idol worshippers may hate it. Surah the Tawbah, the 9th Surah, 33. And Surah the Sof, the 61st Surah, Ayah 9. So now notice what happened here. Aisha is being very intelligent. Because the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Time will come in which Allah and Al-Uzza shall be worshipped. This is after the conquest of Mecca. All of Arabia, okay, during delegations and everything else, all of Arabia is under him. So she's like, how can Allah and Al-Uzza be worshipped when they've been torn down? The statues of Allah and Al-Uzza have been torn down. The 360 idols, they've been destroyed. And Allah said in this ayah, he's the one who sent his messenger with the guidance and the true religion so that it might be dominant over all other religions. She's trying to understand how, how can these two things come together? How is this possible? Now look at the response. How can this be the case when the ayah is indeed true? The Prophet wasallam said, he answered, Indeed, all of what is willed of Allah will happen. Then he will send a cool wind so that anyone who has even a mustard seed's worth of faith in his heart that smells it will die. No good will remain and the people will return to the religion of their fathers. This is collected by my Muslim in uh, his al Jami al-Sahih under uh, Kitab al-Fitin. Okay, the book of tribulations under the chapter, the hour will not be established until the Daus worship Dhul, Dhul, Khalis, Dhul Khalisa. Okay, so this is important. So all of what Allah has will shall happen, but then people will return. The people left after the Muslims die will return to the religion of their forefathers. Now it's like, well, wait a minute, they're already Mushrikeen, they're already Mushriks. What do you mean the religion of their forefathers? Well, there's another hadith in the, in the Sahih of Muslim that I... I forgot to include, which is where shaitan will come to them and unearth idols and say, return to these. So he's not even satisfied with the shirk they're doing at that time. He wants them to go back to the original shirk, that from the time of Nabi and the Nuh, alayhi salam. Look around you. Can't you see the neo-pagan movement? Have you heard of the neo-pagan movement? And under its umbrella, you have Wicca. Everyone's trying to get back to this original worship. People are trying to learn to read the rune language so they can call on Odin. They're trying to get back to this old thing. All these movies are now having this old Scandinavian, this old Norse mythology being brought in. That's what all this is about. People are trying to get back, just like we're trying to keep the purest Islam that we can. They're trying to keep the purest shit that they can. And, they, and just like we have renewers of our religion, they have renewers of their shit. The three most important renewers of the original shirk, Anton Sands de Levy, who founded the Church of Satan, Alistair Crowley, and then Albert Pike. These are the most important, for lack of a better word, sheikhs of the original shirk of Nabi Nuh. So I'm trying to get people back there. It's not enough. Albert Pike was so clear about it. He said, let us be clear that Satan is our Lord and our God. And we have no, nothing to do with any God but him. That's clear enough. He was also a 33rd degree Mason bag. I guess that's sort of by the by, isn't it? It goes without saying. But nonetheless, understand they're trying to get back to their forefathers. That's what everyone's trying to do. Haven't you heard the rise in Egyptology? There are people now dressing up like the ancient pharaohs and trying to 
learn the old language, old, the, trying to learn the Meju Necher and trying to learn how to do the old deities and how to worship them. And there's people carrying out sacrifices. When one of these Egyptologists die, they get the body cremated and they, they uh, wave palm leaves over him and do incantations and chanting. The only thing they're not doing, as far as I know, the only thing they're not doing yet is jabbing a hook up the nose, hooking the frontal lobe of the brain and pulling it down through the nose and putting it in a jar along with the liver and the other organ. That's the only thing they're not doing yet. But if the laws change and keep getting so liberal and lax, they're going to do that. And people will start requesting, when I die, I want an Egyptian burial. That's what I want. An ancient Egyptian burial. I'm going to go out just like the pharaohs. That's what I want. Because cryogenic freezing, isn't it's not spicy enough. People will want to die that way. So understand what's coming. Now, we have the second hadith under this heading. It is also related from Imran ibn Hussein that the Prophet ﷺ said, There will always be a group from my ummah fighting for the truth until the last of them fights the false messiah. This is collected by Imam Abu Dawood in his Sunan under the book of Jihad, under the chapter of Jihad, will always be ongoing. Okay, so they'll always be fighting until the last of them fights the false messiah. Okay, because that's the victory. That's the end. Right? Then when the cool wind comes, that's the hour for us. That's that's the end of the hour for us in, in that sense that this ummah, it's it's time on this earth is complete. Right? So jihad is constant. It will always be ongoing. So when people say, no, no, no. A jihad now is education. You go to college and no, 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 no. We're talking about people that are out there militarily. They're being hit with all different types of artillery and they're striving. There's always going to be a group of brothers that are out there that are doing that until the end. Number three, the third one. It has been related from Jabir bin Samura from the Prophet وسلم, who said, there will never cease to be a group of Muslims fighting for the establishment of this religion until the coming of the hour. Again, this is collected by Imam Muslim in al jamiyyah Sahih with the Book of Governance under the chapter of There shall always be a group manifest on the truth and those who oppose them will not harm them. Number four, Imam Muslim has narrated from Uqba ibn Amr who said that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, there will always be a group from my ummah fighting for the truth, victorious over their enemies. They will not be harmed by those who oppose them until the hour is established. And they are upon that way. This is collected by my Muslim ibn Hajjaj and al-Jami of Sahih, the Book of Governance of the chapter of There Shall Always Be a Group Manifest on the Truth, and those who oppose them shall not oppose them, there will not harm them. Then Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu said after this hadith, Then Allah will send a wind that is sweeter than musk, and softer to the touch than silk, that will not leave anyone who has a mustard seed's worth of faith in his heart, except that it will rapture or cease him, or seize him. The worst of humanity will remain, and the hour will be established upon them. Okay, this is from your Muslim again, same address. So we un so understand then. After all these events take place, the cool wind comes, which brings us to the point. Wait a minute, Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes. There's victory. All these other things happen. The whole world's Muslim. Well, yes, externally. But then he dies. Mahdi dies. And the whole thing depreciates again. The whole thing depreciates again. And the Muslims are raptured off. Now next week, inshallah, it is our hope if Allah preserves our life and yours that we'll be discussing the major signs. And among those major signs... <clears throat> will be after the cool wind, the sun rising from the west, the, de the demolishing of the Kaaba, right? All these other things because you have to understand, and I'll state this again because I don't want to belabor the point, but I think it's significant. Islam can only be seen when it's manifest. And it's manifest by its people. Unbelievers understand this. So when Marshal Tito took over the Balkans with assistance and created with cooperation by merging Bosnia 
uh, Herzegovina, Croatia and Serbia into Yugoslavia. He killed countless scholars, memorizers of the Quran. And that did what? It castrated Islam. Because the people that carry their religion are gone. Books there, all over the place, everything. But the people, they're gone. If you take that away, then the symbols aren't needed. So that's why the other ahadith that we covered weeks ago about the writing of the Quran disappearing from the Mus'hafs. Right? Those things disappearing because who's going to read it? The Kaaba being demolished. Who's going to visit it? These people are unbelievers. They're, and, and it's interesting because they stand condemned. Because like, well, why would Allah destroy the Kaaba and have the, and have the Quran taken away and everything else? Because these people stand condemned. It's a judgment against them. But why? Maybe, maybe, maybe they might believe. No, Allah said they wouldn't believe. They stand condemned. But if they stand condemned, then what's the point of doing all this to show Allah's, to show Allah's will? Show Allah's might? As Allah said in the Quran, that is so that you might know that Allah is all knowing and all wise. So that you know that. So I say again, we serve a holy God and a righteous God. And all of his commands, his plans, and his other things are all with wisdom. And we've seen this throughout history that's mentioned in the Quran. All throughout history in the Quran and the Hadith. We've seen these signs, we've seen the symbols, we've seen the typology over and over and over again. But who will take heed? Who will follow on? Those who Allah has made to hear. Now, we've covered a lot of data today, a lot of maps. And I know that uh, I mentioned a lot of uh, points today. We read through a lot of points. So I understand you'll have questions. But if we can have questions just focused on today, up until the end of this class, and not on sun rising from the west and these other things, because that's for the epilogue next week. So if we can confine our questions to today, inshallah, or if there were other lessons where there seems to be a disconnect between those in this lesson. I'm perfectly fine for that. Yes? Uh, Salaam. Salaam. How do we reconcile the ayah of not taking the unbelievers allies and the Muslims and the Byzantine fighting the Muslims? Sure. So the question is about Surah al to the 5th Surah 51. Um, do not take the people of the book or the Jews or Christians as allies. Right, so how do we reconcile that with this uh, hadith uh, that mentions the Byzantines and the Muslims? Alhamdulillah. Uh, the answer to the question is, is that they won't be by by allies in the Quran is referring to that the fact that you take them as military allies in which because when someone's a wali they have detailed information divulged to them. They have other matters divulged to them and they are uh, knowledgeable of the secrets of the Muslims and such. From the ahadith, what we can glean from them is that's not the type of relationship that they're going to have, that they're both going to come under because they live in the same area. They're going to come in to attack, under attack. And because of that, they'll be fighting alongside of each other in a sulh. So it's not going to be a mithaq. Because a mithaq would mean there's more, there's secrets and there's awliya and things like this. But rather it's going to be a sulh. Listen, we've put this on hold. So we can deal with them. Right. And so there's not going to be issues divulged. They're not necessarily on equal platform because they're both fighting the enemy. And they're still in their separate encampments. That's why it says a man from the Christian encampment, a man from the Muslim encampment. They're still in separate encampments. So they're not intermingled in which that, that such a situation like that could happen. Right. Are there other questions? Other questions? Yes. Yeah, when, um, talks about the cool wind. Okay, um, the ahadith about the cool wind coming and the Muslim smelling and dying. The significance of this in terms of the body and soul. Alhamdulillah. From what we have read, um, 
it mentions that the Muslims who smell that cool wind will die. Now, but there's nothing mentioned about it removing the body. So we understand that the death will be the normal death in terms of the uh, ruh being removed from the body and drawn out. That's what we that's what we know. And because it doesn't mention them bodily being taken up, in that sense, we have no reason to assume that it would be anything but that. So there is what we would see a normal death resulting from something supernatural. Right? It's not going to be nukes. Right? It's going to be a natural, a natural death that will come about through supernatural means. So in an instant, all the Muslims on earth will be dead. Sure. So the question is, if all the bodies are being left behind, what does that mean for the unbelievers that are going to be the only ones left behind? What does that mean for us? And the fact that they will disrespect bodies, uh, if possible, and such. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, we've not been given data on what exactly is going to be done with the bodies by the unbelievers or what have you. Um, because of the sheer volume of people dead, and especially what you read about what the unbelievers are doing, I imagine they're going to be in a state of shock initially. Because if you have all these people dead, I don't think you're going to be wondering about disrespecting them or what have you. I think a lot of them are dead. Um, if I was to posit anything, I would imagine that they'll probably just stack the bodies up and just bury them somewhere, you know, big big burials or whatever else. Because there'll be no one to do Salat al Janazah. There'll be no one to wash them. There'll be no one to do anything. And what's interesting about it is because we'll be taken like that um, so quickly, it looks similar to the death of the Shuhada and that they're just taken. Right? And just left as they are. It doesn't read, because we're not going to be put in keffins. We're not going to be wrapped up in it. It looks similar to the death of a martyr. It's like this whole ummah gets taken like that. So, are there any other questions? Yes, brother. Um, uh, you know how you mentioned about the three Mahdi's? We've got the first Mahdi, which is the Mahdi of Saddam. But we haven't come across the second one yet. Is yeah. the second Mahdi going to come close to the town these, these battles? Okay, so the question is regarding the three Mahdi's. And the second and the third Mahdi, which uh, we've not uh, we've not encountered yet, what is what is the time scale on that, and will they be close to each other? Alhamdulillah. From what we studied over um, the discussion on the Mahdi's, it would be it stands out that the third Mahdi will be handed power by the second Mahdi because of something happened in North Africa and they're being 12 emirs and uh, those other ahadith that we that we read. So that one will be in close proximity to this third one. Yeah. So we've already witnessed one of them. Right. And the second and third one will be no disappointment. Second and third ones will be no disappointment either. Are there any final questions? Yes, brother. And you know the enemy that the Muslims and the, the Byzantines are going to fight, um, fight um, is, that, is that what enemy do you think that's going to be? Um, it could be. Yeah, I mean the question is, um, what what would we surmise the common enemy that the Byzantines and the Muslims are going to find uh, that's going to draw them together in the battle that will cause a sort and draw them together? Alhamdulillah, salat Rasulullah. My answer to the question would be, um, we've not been told um, very much in the commentaries and details. We've not been told. The most I've most I've seen is Al Qadiyab and Al Mazidi say that the common enemy might have to do with those under the sway of Al Masih al Dajjal. It's definitely something to do with that and his coming and his arrival. So it will be it may be a precursor to his appearance, right? And it may have something to do with that. But their exact identity, we're not told that they're the Germans or the Americans or or they're, uh, they're these people. But knowing what we know, we have to now 
understand prophecy not in a newspaper fashion because Muslims in these countries, the English speaking countries, are being socially groomed into a Cold War psychology again regarding the, having this mistrust of Russians thing again because the United States is having problems with Russia and the UK is having problems with Russia. And I'm sure there have already been some lectures already where they're going to say, yes, the, the Russians are going to be that group because they're doing what I call newspaper prophecy. Whatever world events are, okay, maybe we can find something that can go with that. Yes. I mean, and, and it just, it creates a problem because then you find other ahadith. And when you read these ahadith in full relief, you find they're completely contradictory to what these people have made up. Right. Because they were so dead set for the longest time, they said, no, the moon landings didn't happen. Now they say that they did. And Neil Armstrong heard the event on the moon. Then Neil Armstrong had to come out and say, I've never been to any Muslim functions. I didn't hear any of that. And I can assure you, I never have. Buzz Aldrin had to come out and say it. Right. <laughs> These things happen because we read the newspaper and then we try to say, OK, there's got to be something that goes with this. How many people did you see on YouTube? who until fairly recently were saying that uh, Surah 9 verse 11 discusses the 11 September 2001 attacks. And there's an eagle mentioned therein with a tower shaking and these other things. If you can find the word eagle mentioned in the Quran, I will take you to lunch because I can be assured it's not in there. Right. Or, or, or if you can find twin towers, Moshe Yadan, if you can find that in there, I will take you to lunch because it's not in there. That's how confident I was. It's not even a gamble. It's confidence because it doesn't exist in there. But people have tried to find one thing or another. They've tried to say that America, the Arabic word for America, is in the Ahadith. People have said this. They've tried to say Saddam Hussein is mentioned. It, just, it, it, it soils the whole principles behind what prophecy is and what it represents and how we are to understand prophecy and the commentaries and the people that have painstakingly tried to not overanalyze it and inject their own viewpoints into it. I mean, if it was up to me, I would say, yeah, that enemy is America. Because that's my thinking. But I have to be smart enough to not do that. It's America and specifically the United States, those shayateen, it's them, right? That would be my type of thinking because that's my mindset. That is my mindset. Or I say it would either be them or it would be uh, the United Kingdom. Yes, it's definitely them. Because that comes from your thinking of how you feel about a people. Just like when people say that the English are yet Juju Majuj because they, they hate them. So it's okay, well, we hate them, so we'll make them yet Juju Majuj. Well, that will not make them yet Juju Majuj. English are 60 million deep, tops. Okay, the Turkic peoples are way more than that. English isn't a master language, it's only 500 years old. Right? They're not an enormous amount of people. They're not 10 to 1 in terms of odds on the Arabs. That's, they, they, don't, they don't have anywhere near those numbers. So it's just understanding these types of things. So I can only tell you what I know. And unfortunately, um, what I know is as much as what we've gone through and what the commentators have said. And unfortunately, that's all I have. All right. So, yes. Um, worst of uh, creation will be left behind how long will they be left to their devices until their destruction comes about so the question is how long will uh, the unbelievers after the cool wind how long will they be left behind before the events unfold uh, that precipitate the day of resurrection alhamdulillah that is for next week inshallah so we'll be covering that in some detail okay are there any final questions yes Peace to the Hadith uh, about the 99 shall be killed in the fight. Yes. Uh, just that last sentence, can you explain that? It says, Every man among them shall have that one that will be saved. Okay. So the question is on page two the Hadith that about the Euphrates drying up, that out of every 199 shall be killed, every man among them shall have that one that will be saved. Okay, so what is this referring to? Alhamdulillah. What he's doing is he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's just reiterating what the first, what the 
sentence before said. So out of every 100, 99 shall be killed in the fight. Every man among them shall have that one that will be saved. Meaning, so every man among that group, right, shall have that one. He'll be that one that's saved. So every group of 100 shall have that one man that won't get killed. Right, there'll be that one. Right, every single group will have that one. It's a reiteration. It's a it's a rhetorical device that's often used for emphasis. It's like where someone says, uh, "I was lucky to get out of there alive," or "I hung on by the skin of my teeth." It emphasizes how dire the situation was. It's the same thing he's doing here. It's to make make you understand how dire the situation was. Right? Yes. Okay, so the hadith that mentions the best of the martyrs, does it refer to them being the best of the martyrs at that time? Alhamdulillah. Yes, because it says they will be the best of the mar best of the martyrs in their time, or best of their people. When you hear that language of their people, or they will be the best of their people, or the best at that time, yomayidin, it means of that time, right? Because we know that... Um, the uh, Asad or the Sayyid al-Shuhada is Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. That we know. We know the Sayyida Shababi Ahl al-Jannah. That the two masters of the youth of Jannah are Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein. So we know it can't be in an absolute sense because we've already been told who the master of the martyrs is and who the, the, the two masters of the, of the youths of the martyrs are. So that much we know. So these are the best of their time and not in an absolute sense. Yes. Last point. Um, you know, when we say that Isa Islam comes down and it says in the hadith that he will lead them, right? What about the hadith where um, they have the back and forth about who's going to lead the salah and then he says, I'll come back down as a follower? Okay, so the question is about the hadith where Nabi Isa alayhi salam uh, comes down to uh, the masjid with the white minaret and the eastern white minaret and uh, the Mahdi. They have the discussion, and he tells the Mahdi, I've come back to be a follower. Um, and the Mahdi leads the Salah. Alhamdulillah. Now, that is to do with a follower in the Salah, but not necessarily a follower in rule. Because Al Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam is the Khalifa of these Arabs. He's the Khalifa of the Arabs that comes back. His battles are primary dealing with the Arab world. Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes back as a Hakaman Muqsitan comes back as a just judge and he rules with the revealed law of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam breaks the cross lifts the jizya and he's the one that brings as we see in the ahadith he brings Islam over every, over everything al mahdi alayhi salam he's coming from the quraysh and gathering all the arabs right the in gathering of the arabs right because by that time two thirds of them will have been exterminated so he's the in gatherer of the arabs and then nabi isa alayhi salam al masih he comes and he's the global ruler when it's all said and done. So, if there's no final question, we will close here and prepare for the epilogue next week. We say, Subhanakallahumma bahamdika wa ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa yitubu ilayk innahu ghafur rahim rahim rahimin wa la ilaha illa Allah wa assalamu alaikum.